What's happening guys? Kenny here again and today I've got another hype versus reality video for you guys and if you read the thumbnail and uh, the description you know what this is all about. It's about this guy. Whammo. That's right guys. This is a Peter Rizzenti Custom Snafu 2.0. Uh, for those of you guys that don't know, uh, Peter Rizzenti is a custom maker out of Canada. And um, he has had a few production models. Um, uh, Spider Co's done the Nirvana. And then also they did the, um, the newest one would be the Paisan. That's how you guys would know of Peter Rizzenti if you don't know of his customs. But in saying that, he's obviously more well known for his customs. And he's well known for being um, making mostly titanium integrals. So that what that means is that it is the handle is made out of one piece of titanium. So there are no um, there's not two separate part scales that go together with a backspacer or um, standoffs or anything. It's just cut out of one piece. And what that means is that. Uh, there's a lot less room for error, guys. Um, and if something's weird with one piece of titanium or as they're cutting, they make a mistake, that means this whole thing goes in the trash and they got to start over. So it's a really uh, sweet dynamic. Um, in saying that, uh, Peter Rizzenti Customs pretty much start in the ballpark of about $1,500 and pretty much just go up from there. So we are talking about a very expensive uh, custom knife here. And Peter Rizzenti is well known for his, um, just the, the uh, worksmanship on his knives and the action as well. So uh, first things first, I want to give a huge shout out and thank you to 25 to Knife. Um, Kyle, I want to just thank you so, um, so much. Um, I'm so immensely um, gracious for your... Um, for your generosity here. And um, he lent me this knife and also uh, surprised me with a boost blade smoke in the package with this guy. If you saw the first impressions, you'll know that already. But um, yeah, that is just amazing of, of Kyle. And he's been a sub of mine for a really uh, long time now, almost since the beginning. I'm gonna get some smudges off of this here, get some fingerprints. Um, but yeah, he has been a sub forever and he's been trying to get me to, um, to try knives for a while now. When I first started, uh, getting into a little bit more high end knives, he was intent on getting me a CRK. He was like, man, you gotta handle a CRK. And, um, when I finally did get one in hand, uh, Steve sent me his 25 and it just blew me up. But but in fact, Kyle's been trying to get me to uh, borrow one of his for a long time now, but I was always too nervous and I'm always like, ah, I don't know, man, I use my knives pretty extensively. But he always said like, come on, man, I, you know, no problem, no problem. Well, finally I said, okay, after I got the Nkosi, he said again, dude, you gotta try a Resenti. Um, he saw how, how I was really just, how appreciative I was of the details of the Sabinza and he was like, you gotta try a, a, my, one of my Resentis. So in saying that, I finally, <laughs> I finally, uh, said, okay. And I said, next, you know, next time you want, you know, you get, you know, he had this one in for a uh, service actually. And he was like, as soon as it gets back, I'm sending it to you. So he did. And guys, um, I'm just so grateful, but, uh, first things first, this is a hype versus reality. For those of you guys that don't know, um, uh, my hype versus reality, I, uh, first I do specs, then I do uh, size comparisons, then I go into the hype of the knife, uh, which is sometimes that could be hype created by the manufacturer, that could be hype created by the designer. Um, a lot of times it's done by distributors. Um, sometimes hype just comes from the community, you know, uh, YouTube reviewers, um, uh, blade forms and stuff like that. And then of course there's the hype that we create, uh, our personal hype. So. Uh, first things first, I'm going to go ahead and put the specs on the page. Well, no, I'm not because there are not specs out there on the internet for this guy. So I am going to be reading off specs today for you guys. So sorry about that. If it's, uh, 
not your jam, but it's usually not mine, but here we go. So first things first, um, the overall length of the knife is eight and three quarters. Um, this is not a small knife, guys. Uh, these are half inch uh, squares, just so you know. So you can do the math if you wanted to. You could kind of do the math. But this is um, eight and three quarters is the length. And then you've got a, a three and three quarter inch blade that is going to this point here. So that's not going all the way back here. That's just to that point where the handle um, furthest out point is. And then um, we have a cutting surface or the cutting edge is going to be uh, three and a half inches. Here's the cutting edge. And or right around three and seven sixteenths, just under three and a half inches. Um, and then you've got the handle length of five and a sixteenth. And that's from this point to this point. Um, your grip size is four inches pretty much right on the money. Uh, the blade width, this dimension here, is going to be an inch and a quarter. Um, your handle width, the thickness at the thickest point below the pocket clip is uh, 0.486, which is right around 31 64ths, just under a half inch. Um, on the clip, you've got 0 0.602, so about 602 thousandths just um, over a half inch, just under five eighths of an inch. So those are your dimensions. Um, I'm sure there's other ones that I could go over and I will later. And then um, going right into some size comparisons, this will give you a good clear uh, picture of how big this guy is. Um, first things first, I'm gonna go ahead and bring this guy into the picture. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding guys. I'm just gonna put him up in the corner. That's my gift from Kurt, this two sons with my uh, Ugly mug, laser etched in the pocket. So yeah, that's gonna stay up there. Uh, then I'm gonna go ahead and bring out Chris Reeves and Kosi, cause that's a pretty good size comparison. Although the Resenti still kind of dwarfs the Kosi a little bit. Um, and then we'll go ahead and bring in Strider SNG. Again, pretty small compared to the, I mean, if we line this up, you're talking eh, maybe a half inch, uh, maybe a little more smaller overall. Go ahead and bring in some spider codes. Got the PM2 and the Manix 2. And then we'll go ahead and bring in, uh, just for good measure, we'll bring in a Benchmade. Just because I know a lot of you guys have these 940s. Give you a good, um, t you guys can see that it's pretty much dwarfed by that. Although, um, a lot of times, I mean, look at the blade length. It's not that much smaller, guys. And cutting edge, almost about the same. Oh, and I did want to show you this. Uh, when we're talking grip, size it's just it's even bigger than the pm2 so got another about half inch on the grip size so that's a lot of real estate there guys <clears throat> next i'll bring in a few knives that really do kind of compare this is the socom elite as you guys can see that is pretty much the same size slightly longer than the resenti <coughs> excuse me and then of course the recon one cold steel recon one Makes the Resenti kind of look small, so you guys can really understand how big that uh, Recon 1 is. And um, if you have a Recon 1, you can understand how big the Resenti is. Um, not quite the Recon 1, which is like a 9.5 inch knife. So, yeah, very large knife. So now that we got that out of the way, um, I'm going to go ahead and get into uh, the height on this knife. And where the height begins, guys, um, is it's just with... Peter Rosenti's name and what he's well known for, which is just um, really high end customs, guys. Um, when you're talking fifteen hundred dollars plus, we're really getting into a new, another level of customs. Um, a lot of customs and mid techs, you, you know, we're in that like six to twelve hundred dollar range, and um, you know, that's that's really like kind of where I would feel comfortable getting into the custom world. But Peter Rosenti is on another level. You know, he's got just amazing integrals uh some of his stuff it's just 
I've been watching his uh, YouTube, uh, not YouTube, uh, his Instagram lately, and God, guys, it's just unimaginable. Some of his stuff, it's just beautiful, and um, and and very functional as well, which I'll get into. But yeah, so uh, he's well known for just making really beautiful knives. Um, like I said, titanium integrals, uh, which are you know known for their strength, uh, integrity, also their. Um, it's it's very simple, guys. There's no there's not any body screws, nothing going on. Just a pivot screw, and possibly uh, sometimes they do like uh, uh, lock bar inserts and stuff. But this one doesn't even have that. It just has the detent and uh, the lock uh, the pocket clip screws and the pivot screw. That's all it's got going on. So very simplistic. Um, they are also known for their strength and lightness because there's not a lot going on. So. In saying that, uh, also there's there's some hype surrounding uh, the Peter Rosinti right now because of the Spider Co that's coming out, the Paisan, which I think it, it's pretty much just a kind of a replica of one of his custom models, the Paisan. So or Paisan, however it's said. I know I'm saying it wrong. I think it's French, um, and I'm saying it differently than uh, the French people would. But anyways. Um, yeah, that knife, uh, it's got a lot of hype surrounding it right now. So Peter Rosenti has uh, quite a bit of hype surrounding him right now. Uh, in saying that, uh, this really just is above and beyond what I would have even expected. I mean, at $1,500, you, you expect a lot. But yeah, this knife was really cool. It was really awesome for me to be able to get this in hand. I would thank you so much to Kyle because I would have never been able to get something like this in hand unless I was at a, a blade show or something. Really amazing of him. So in saying that, uh, a lot of the uh, hype and everything that's that's out there about Rosenti, I hadn't even heard it because except for the stuff with like the um, Nirvana that used to be, um, that was his first collaboration with uh, Spyderco. Those are the types of things that I had heard about Rosenti before. And just like, you know, here and there from my friends on Instagram and YouTube that have told me like, oh, Rosenti's the man, you know, when it came to stuff, um, to integrals and stuff like that. So in saying that, there was a bit of hype and, um, and then that hype was kind of uh, magnified by me, like, oh man, I can't wait to see and feel and know what this is all about. Um, and after handling, for instance, the Nkosi and seeing what uh, was capable from uh, Chris Reeve, I, I was really intrigued by just handling something that was even on the next level. So, the reality, guys, uh, the reality, once I got this thing out of box, uh, <sighs> I don't know if you if you guys watched my first impressions, but yeah, guys, this thing was just um, just amazing. As soon as I got it out of the box, first things first, um, I want to talk about the fit and finish. Uh, the finish, guys, I'm not usually a huge fan of orange peel, like that texturing, but this is like just on another level. It's... It's so well done, almost like he did it by hand, you know, with a grinder or something, with a Dremel. But it's so beautiful, guys. It is really awesome. And such a beautiful touch having the same orange peel uh, texture on the, th on the th not thumb studs, guys, on the stop pins. Um, yeah. And then on the pivot screw as well. Just really gives it an awesome look. And um, these are contoured as well, as you can see. And every line, guys, uh, most of these lines, even where the orange peel kind of uh, meets the, the cutouts, is so crisp and done so not well. There's only one spot where I noticed where it wasn't quite as crisp, and it's because the orange peel kind of collided with an edge there. But mostly just beautifully done. And that is nothing, guys. I'm, I'm not even... I'm being super hypercritical here. So as you guys can see, everything is so beautifully done. Um, lines are super crisp. As you guys can see, um, everything's chamfered really well. All these lines on the blade are chamfered extremely well. Um, these lines here are kept... Uh, relatively crisp and sharp, but they are knocked down, so they're not sharp. 
They are not sharp at all. I would never think they're gonna even do any damage. Even here on this jimping back here, it's it's chamfered well, and although I can feel the edge, it's not sharp. Uh, the edges in here are chamfered well. This inside edge isn't chamfered amazingly, but it's done enough where it's not gonna cut you. It's not gonna really become a hot spot or anything. And this right here is even knocked down, so it's not a sharp point. Uh, this area here is left a little sharp, if I'm being super critical. That's something he definitely could have knocked down with a little file or something. But again, guys, I'm being extremely critical here. And because this lines up right with that, with the flipper tab stop, I never even noticed this at all. It, it, this flipper tab keeps you away from it and the way that your finger fits in the choil. So really well done as far as the chamfering and stuff. Um, and then of course the blade finish guys. Wow. Um, this is like a stone wash finish. So he does a stone wash and then he polishes it. And oh my gosh, guys, this thing is absolutely gorgeous. The This is a clip point, obviously clip point um, saber ground with a swedge here. And the way that the light bounces and plays off of it, you guys can see me there. There I am. There's that ugly mug. It's just upside down from this one. That's what you were going for, right, Kurt? There you go. So, yeah, really beautiful um, finish on this blade. And the way that the, the fuller or blood groove, whatever you want to call it, the way that that's done, it's very crisp, yet uh, all chamfered nicely. And everything, uh, as far as the blade grind goes, is terminated pretty, uh, pretty amazingly. This is a hand ground blade. Um, like, if I'm being super critical, I can see that this terminates a little bit further back on the right side of the blade there than on the left side. But guys, again, being super critical. As far as the swedge is concerned, everything terminates pretty evenly. Uh, blade grind seems to be really nice and even. And you guys can see that in something like this in an integral, you see how tight the tolerances are there, how this blade fits super tight. Kind of like a, you look at a Chris Reeve. I mean, that's what we're talking about tolerances, guys. It, the amount of like play you have there for um, for mistake or for, you know, it's just, there's nothing there. It's gotta be perfect or you're gonna have uh, the blade rubbing the handle scale. Yeah, so um, this is just the same with a very thick stock blade that is ground amazingly to be perfectly centered, guys, for talking uh, fit here. That thing is so perfectly centered. And that comes down to the finish, the blade grind that he did as well, because if he had ground this slightly off or anything, you might as well throw it in the garbage because it's not gonna fit in the handle scales. Or handle scale, I should say. It's not scales, it's not two scales, it's just one solid chunk. Um, as you guys can see there, it's milled beautifully and very smooth lines. He must have had to do that very slowly with a very sharp bit. Um, when you're doing these integrals, as they're cutting this out, if, if they cut something too fast with, at a wrong speed, with too much heat or something, everything's gonna go wonky. Everything's just gonna twist and bend. And so he has to be very careful. That's why these integrals are so um, hard to get right. So yeah, just beautifully done. And um, as far as fit goes, everything fits so amazingly. Um, it's just really, really beautifully done. There is a little bit of a gap here on the pocket clip, but I think that's just due to the orange peel. You know, it's impossible to have a flat surface sit flat up against a surface that's not flat, obviously. Uh, that sounds just like an oxymoron. But you can see there's a little bit of space there under the clip, and that's because the clip does land directly on top of this lock bar cutout, where you see Peter Rosenti's 
only maker's mark on this knife. I forgot to mention that earlier. Yeah, that's the only mark signifying who made this knife. But if you look at that design, there's not too many guys out there that you would consider this knife to be. This is a Rosenti. And that's what's great about a maker like Rosenti is you know that's his knife. There's not as many makers. I mean, it's like a Spyderco, you know? You know a Spyderco is a Spyderco just by the look. That's a nice touch, guys, to have that kind of, um, you know, maker prowess. So, really cool. Uh, just fit and finish-wise, this thing is done amazingly. And even this jimping, guys, uh, I'm not a huge fan of jimping. I, I don't mind it, but this jimping's done very well. It's a, It's slightly sharp if you, like, push down, but it's it's chamfered well where it's not, like... It's not something that would bother me. Um, that is a nice touch. Uh, as far as the finish here on the on the choil, I think that could have been done a little better. Uh, it's a little blocky. Like if it was knocked back and this edge was knocked back a little, I feel like it would have been a little more useful as a choil. But for me guys, um, and my medium to large size hands, I get kind of caught up in that choil and it is a little blocky. But I'll get more into that in ergonomics. So, yeah. Nice touch, guys. And you guys can see that the stop pins are also the stop when it comes back. And it's done extremely well. And everything seems to hit just, just right. Uh, there's no weirdness or wonkiness uh, with the lockup. Solid lockup, guys, in every direction. No lock rock, guys. No lock rock. Um, and absolutely no lock stick in any direction, guys. I know that the Paisan's been getting a lot of slack for, you know, this moving and lock stick and no lock bar insert, no over travel stop, and no lock stick, guys. No lock stick. You just heard it going like that, is all you heard, but no lock stick. So it doesn't have anything to do with uh, lock bar insert, guys. It's all about the geometry. I know that, I mean, and you guys can see that lock up looking at about maybe 25, 30% and no travel, guys. That thing is solid. I'm, I can't push it in. I, it, the lock up on this, guys, is uh, immaculate. This is what they're supposed to be. That, that's what it's supposed to be. No lock bar insert. You don't need it if the, if the um, you know, if all the, the dimensions are correct and the geometry is correct on that lock bar, there, it's not going to have lock stick if it's done well. So that's just a beautiful touch as far as fit and finish go, as far as fit goes, guys. And really well done. And as you guys can see, that zirconium um, pivot screw with a collar around it, really well done as well. Um, yeah, in saying that, uh, guys, I will go, go ahead, ahead and go into the action. And if you saw the first impressions, you'll know where this is going, but pretty freaking insane, guys. Um, the deployment is just awesome. I don't think I ever had a fail with this, really, unless I was trying. If you want to push button it, if you want to just 12 o'clock pull. Or if you want to use the, the blood groove, whatever you want to call it, and finger flick. That, you got to make sure you get that finger in there. That's the only thing is you can slip off of that blood groove off of the fuller. But if you make sure that you're putting a little bit of pressure upwards as you're doing it. Let's see if I can first finger flick it. It's a little harder to get in the blood groove, but yeah. Nice, uh, nice detent guys, really well done. I know that the Paisan's also been getting crap for the detent. No issues with detent here, guys. I can, can hear it there, trying to come out of the detent but I am shaking it. There you go. Okay. That's what it took to get that thing to fly out. And I am off the lock bar guys. Yeah, really well done. It's 
So detent's good on this. And this is a big, heavy blade, guys. It's a very thick, heavy blade. Here, I'm gonna go ahead and show you this, just because I didn't show you in the dimensions. I will go ahead and do uh, behind the edge thickness as well, but we're gonna 1.76 stock thickness. So that's a thick stock, guys. That is not a thin stock knife. Very heavy, long blade. And um, it still has really good uh, retention as far as detent goes. And that's, that's it, guys. It's just a detent ball put in there and then obviously grinding the hole in the blade, uh, drilling the hole in the blade, but beautifully done for detent. Um, yeah, and then action on closing. <laughs> Do I really need to even uh, say anything here? It is like a hydraulic feeling, guys. As soon as that blade gets moving, there is no way it's gonna stop. It is just immaculate. And it doesn't have like as free falling of a feel. It's more like I'm saying hydraulic. Like see, I can put it on its side here. As soon as I get more vertical, there it is. And it's really enjoyable, guys. Um, really enjoyable. I'll show you where the detent ball, here's where it inter, interacts with the detent there. It's where it's stopping. That's up on top of it. So one thing that you'll notice, and this is the first thing I noticed because it freaking guillotined me about four times the first day. But if you are not placing your thumb in the right spot to get that just past the detent, it, <laughs> yeah. Um, I cut myself at least three times the first day I had this guy. And yeah, I'm an idiot, but it is just dropped so fast. And Kyle even told me that he slowed it down by tightening the pivot. If he didn't do that, I probably would have just chopped my finger right off. <laughs> uh, I'm just kidding. It, it didn't have an amazing um, factory edge, which I'll get into after this. But uh, yeah, really, really nice guys as far as the dropping action. Um, on the Snafu, the original snafu, the flipper tab was longer and I feel like that would have made it a little easier in dropping it down to your thumb. But in saying that, once you get used to this, it's no issue at all. You have to make sure you know where to put your thumb. Or you can just do this and get it ready. So yeah, beautiful action guys and just immaculate. Um, I can use this stud to flip it out with my left hand. It's a little harder with my right because I end, end up like somewhat choking it out. But it's not even a thumb stud, guys. That's just your stop pins, but you can use it. and Or you can just pinch the blood groove and use it like that. That's how I did it when I wanted to slow roll it. Nice touch. Um, yeah, so in saying that, uh, action is spectacular. Um, as far as cutting ability, guys, uh, you, I didn't really talk about this when I talk about the blade uh, finish, but when you're talking about a blade stock that's, you know, 0.176, it's a thick stock, guys. So it's all about the grind coming down to the edge. I'm going to go ahead and put some uh, footage of me cutting with this knife on the, on the screen right now. And you guys will see, this knife performed on another level from anything um, I've tried with this kind of stock thickness. Uh, my Chavez does perform well with a nice hollow grind, but this thing is hollow ground like a beast. And it just, it's amazingly thin behind the edge. And when I get into the, um, when I actually bring out the calipers and show you this, you're gonna be blown away, but it is just, it's just an amazing slicer. And for that kind of stock thickness, for it to cut like it does is just amazing. It is just a joy to use, guys. Just a joy. And this is XHP steel. I haven't, uh, I didn't specify that at the beginning here. So it's XHP, um, CTS XHP done by Carpenter. And Carpenter uh, XHP is, it's a great all around steel. And if done like a custom heat treat on XHP, 
just, I can't even imagine what the capabilities would be because even with uh, production heat treat, it can be taken to a pretty high HRC. You know, we were seeing Spyderco and some other companies, uh, Cold Steel doing between 60 and 61, or actually I think some Cold Steel's even got up to 63. Um, Spyderco as well as getting up into that 62 to 63 range with their XHP. So I can't imagine that a, um, a custom maker can take it to a, a whole nother level even with um, getting the carbide formation even tighter and just everything should be even um, even better done, you know, even more well done, like as far as grain structure and everything. Um, and in saying that, with this knife, uh, the, the factory edge was not amazingly done. It seemed like it was kind of like a, a convex edge um, and it probably... I'm sure Kyle used it, so it did seem like it had some use on it, and um, I did strop it and use it a little bit before I sharpened it, but it didn't seem to be amazing. Um, and even with a somewhat, you know, let's say a dull edge, it still cut through cardboard like it would just a demon. So that just shows geometry does have a lot to do with how your knife's going to cut, and this knife still cut well even with a dull edge. In saying that, after I put my edge on it, um, and I didn't even really lay it back at all, because I, you know, it's not my knife, and um, I didn't want to broaden that that uh, secondary bevel too much. So I went at about seventeen degrees, and it still broadened a little bit, just because, like I said, the original was like a convex, and it seemed like it was more like maybe nineteen or something. But with at seventeen degrees, guys, this thing is just amazing at slicing guys it is just a laser beam really and it cuts so well and like i said it was just such a joy to use so i um, mean bringing you back uh i'm gonna go ahead and show you some uh dimensions here let me go ahead and bring out the calipers again and i'm gonna show you uh here we go let me make sure we're all zeroed out Eleven thousandths. That's back here, guys. As you can see, the bevel broadens. Like at the thickest part in the very back here by the I'm talking seventeen, and that's at that extremely thicker, much thicker part. When we get up here into this thinner section of the hollow grind, seven thousandths, guys. Really hard to get this on this knife because there's such a small bevel. Seven thousands. Sorry, like I said, guys, it's hard to get this on film here. I did even get a five thousands on the original one. Twelve thousands. I think it was like right here. I got five. Yeah, it's hard for me to get this right now, especially with that glare. Go ahead and go all the way up to the tip. So 15 thousandths at that, you know, thicker tip. So guys, just really well done. Um, I did... I did get a five thousandths, like I said at the beginning, but I did broaden this bevel just a little bit. Like you could even see the secondary bevel when I got it, guys. It was so small. And like I said, this is at about 17 thousandths, maybe even 16. It was right there, right around 17, 16, uh, 17, 16 degrees per side, not thousandths, guys, sorry. So about 17 to, 16 to 17 degrees per side, maybe about 33 inclusive. And yeah, amazingly thin behind the edge and sliced like a beast, guys. Really, really amazing how this thing um, performed. And I was so impressed by that. And the XHP, guys, what I noticed is the first edge I put on it, uh, it came up pretty easily and it took a long time, even though we're talking a very small bevel here. Um, and the reason for that is because it seems to be done pretty hard. Like it seems like this uh, XHP is 
up into that 63, 64 range, hopefully. But that's what it seemed like just in the sharpening. It took forever, even with, um, I did start with, excuse me, I did start with a 300 grit because I didn't want to go too aggressively at this knife, just with it being a Peter Rosenti custom. But I did go at it and it took a long time to reprofile with a 300 grit stone, even though that bevel's tiny. So uh, it did take a while with that 300 grit and when it did come up, it came up pretty well, but it didn't hold it as long as I was expecting. And I think what that is, guys, um, we're talking about an extremely thin ground blade, as you guys can see there. And this thing has tons of life to it. You're talking, you could sharpen it probably 20 times before the thing even starts to get any thicker. Um, so that's a super aggressive hollow grind there. And what that means, look at how it distorts my thumb there. Pretty cool. So what that means is that when he was buffing this to make this thing so perfectly mirrored, um, I don't know if he's doing that by hand, especially with a um, hollow grind like this. He might be using a wheel. And even at slow speeds, a wheel's gonna heat up. With this being such a thin dimension right here, I wouldn't be surprised if he had a little bit of overheating. Not necessarily in the grinding, but in the, in the polishing, guys. Um, it could have happened in the grinding as well, but I would hope that uh, Peter's using some kind of liquid cooled um, grinding. Um, but yeah, in polishing as well, guys, that's something that you have to worry about. Uh, polishing wheels, create heat very quickly so I'm not sure if he's if he's hand polishing or not but I would think that $1,500 kind of um, indicates that maybe it's hand polished but in saying that I did notice that the first edge uh, didn't come up as amazingly smoking as I expected the second edge did come up better so yeah I don't know and I I'm sure that even in subsequent um, sharpenings this thing should <clears throat> just continue to um, get better and better. Um, as far as ergonomics, guys, I'll go ahead and get into the ergonomics of this guy. Very well done, guys. Um, I didn't notice it. It is a little thinner in this dimension. We are talking um, at this right here, it's 13 16 and it fills the hand pretty well. And then uh, 15 16 right here, just under a, an inch, and then again, 15 or seven eighths right here, because it does kind of dip down, and then you see there's like almost like a step pattern here, and it actually fits in the hand really well, really nicely done, and then the contouring as well just really feels good. I never notice anything. Um, there is a little bit of the blade being kind of far away from your hand here. We are talking about about three quarters of an inch from the edge there, which it's a lot. But in hard use, I didn't really notice like when I'm doing a lot of cutting because um, I'm out here and it doesn't bother me. Um, in finer detail cutting, you could come up here. Although I did say, um, like I said before, this is a little blocky feeling. And in this grip, it would be okay. As you can see, I've got plenty of clearance there. Um, when I come in here, yeah, that's not comfortable, guys. That is gonna cut me. Um, I, you gotta be extra careful. But other than that, um, the grip back here is extremely nice and I had no issues there. It was just coming up here, this is, this is tight. And again, guys, my hands, uh, three and three quarters uh, this way, uh, four inches from this point to this point, um, and three, I'm sorry, and six and, and a quarter from this point to this point. So that gives you a kind of a, a rough estimate of how that's gonna feel in your hand. Um, as you guys can see, this is a PM2, my hand, how it fits in a PM2, pretty much just dead on. You guys are going to have plenty of real estate there, no matter how big your hands are. It might get a little thin back here, but that's a point where you don't really notice when something gets thin. Your pinky is the smallest finger, of course, and stuff. But yeah, really nice as far as ergonomics are concerned. And I didn't notice any hot spots. Uh, the clip is obviously contoured and really low so that's just a non-issue at all didn't feel that at all guys so just beautifully done as far as ergonomics go in any grip really um, except for choking up guys that's the only one that I really had an issue with 
Um, this is nice though, like this little ramp right here that, where your thumb sits. And then back in here, the like I said, the jimping's very well placed, um, very comfortable. So really enjoyed that. Really enjoyed using the knife all around. Um, as far as um, in the pocket goes, of course, you guys want to know what that's about. Wouldn't happen to be the name of my channel or anything. But in the pocket, um, it does carry pretty well. Actually, for the size of the knife, it carries amazingly. Um, you can see it does kind of swing back there. And as you know, as I already mentioned, this flipper tab is even smaller than the original. I'm sure you did that by design. I'm sure some people were complaining about a long flipper tab. I don't know. It doesn't really bother me. But this flipper tab is very functional. I never find myself slipping off. It doesn't have any jimping, but I never have any issues. So just the angle of the flipper tab and everything really works well for ergon um, for um, flipping, but also uh, just really disappears in the pocket and there's no notice of that. And uh, as I said before, this is a fairly thin knife, so it just fits in the pocket really well and disappears, to be honest. Um, and, and as I said, it kind of swings back, so it really just dips back in the pocket. And then on top of that, we're talking about an almost nine inch knife here, guys. Yeah, 4.46. So, you know, that's just immaculate, guys. That's just excellent. And that some of that's due to the fact that we've got a integral, you know, and, and there's a lot of milling as far as like contouring and stuff. So, and then of course this milling here. So it really does lighten this knife up a lot and at you know, that's actually one of the first things when I, when I got this thing, I took it to work and um, I had to show my boss. I was like, dude, look at what one of my subs sent me. Um, I was just blown away by Kyle's uh, generosity. So I wanted to show him and, and he, he, he like, I put it in his hand and he was like, holy crap, this thing's way lighter than I thought it was going to be. So, you know, just seeing like, see, you see it and you think it, it's going to be heavy. But when, when you put it in your hand, um, it's really not. And the balance is really nice as well. Although I know a lot of people don't give a give a shit about balance, but yeah, it is a very nicely balanced knife that um, if you're doing something and this is in your hand, it's not gonna fall out. As you guys can see, it's really just nicely balanced and it, it feels great in the hand. It, it looks like it's gonna be uh, blade heavy for sure. Definitely looks like that. Um, this can feel telescopic, like I'm saying. Um, it does right there feel like a little blade heavy, but I did not notice that in use. It feels really good. And getting work done, it's kind of nice to have a heavy blade. So anyways, or a blade heavy uh, knife, I should say. So that was nice, guys. It really was very comfortable. And then there was one other thing that kind of was something to note. Um, for someone that's not a knife person, I always am intrigued by what they think. And I have shown this to there's a guy at my work that I always show him the new knives I get and he's always intrigued he kind of loves knives too so he although he doesn't collect them he's just a, a user and he just kind of here and there has collected them over the years um in saying that he loves this knife he absolutely was blown away by uh the CRK and Kosi when he got this knife he was like whoa blown away you know looked at the blade was like holy crap and then he went to hold it and he was like, I don't really like it. And I'm like, what? Really? And he goes, yeah, I actually like the CRK a lot better. And there's an element of like this feeling just a little more like sturdy, like I'm going to beat the hell out of this thing and it's never going to do anything. Uh, whereas this one does have a bit of a hollower feel to the handle and everything because it's integral and they, you know, milled a lot of uh, titanium out of it. Um, that to us is probably a, a benefit, you know, that's nice. It makes it lighter. It makes it more, um, ergonomic and stuff like that. But to someone that's not a knife person, this just feels like a more, uh, solid, like, or like, uh, a work knife, you know what I mean? So it was interesting to me to get that impression, to get his uh, impression of it, to be like, I, I don't like it as much as the CRK. And that's also where we get into like, um, diminishing returns for some people, at least, you know what I mean? When you really look at this thing with the zirconium, which zirconium is a type of, uh, um, type of, uh, metal guys, kind of like titanium. It's, it's not steel. It's, it's, it's a, it's actually a more rare element. 
and it's very hard, like titanium, and very light, and also very beautiful. So uh, zirconium pivot with pivot collar, um, all the elements of this knife really add up to the, you know, the the titanium, obviously, um, with that perfect geometry uh, on the on the lock bar and the insert and all. I mean, not insert, but the um, the detent being perfect. All these little things that add up to a fifteen hundred dollar custom from Peter Rizzinti. Uh, they're not they're not here in something like this. This is a production knife. Even though it's done to the tolerances of something like this, it's still not to that level. If 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 Chris Reeve makes different choices on this, like this knife, then this becomes this cost. If this was an integral, it'd probably be damn close to this cost. So that's where you just have to you know see where the 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 point of diminishing returns is for you personally. For me, guys. Um, this is kind of how I'm going to wrap up. I'm just going to talk about whether I would buy a Peter Rizzenti, whether I'm going to send this knife off to Kyle and then a week later buy a Peter Rizzenti. Um, to be perfectly honest with you guys, I'm probably not going to. And it has nothing to do with the functionality, the, the beauty, the, um, the attention to detail, the tolerances, the action, it has nothing to do with that. It's every bit of worth that money to me, it, personally. I do think it's worth it. But this knife right here, guys, this is kind of where I'm finding my uh, sweet spot, uh, personally. This pretty much clicks every box for me. Um, obviously, it's not the most flicky knife, um, although this thing has... Worn in very nice. It's just not a flicky knife. And it never will be. It's just not made to be. Um, but in saying that, as a functional knife, and even as like something I'm proud of, and you know, I love to pull it out, and it, this ticks every box for me, guys. Um, and as you know, um, I will have the um, height versus reality coming out, or I'm not sure if this came out before this or not, but... Yeah, this is such an amazing knife, guys, and I love it. So I think this is kind of where the top level of my um, interest is at this point. I do want, like, I want a Chavez custom, you know. I want to see what that's all about. Definitely want to want to get a custom here and there. But I'm not like, you know, I want a custom uh, uh, Ferrum Forge and stuff like that. But I think those in that, like, $600 to $1,000 range are kind of where I feel comfortable uh, when I get up into that $1,500 range, I'm starting to think like I could get three of these. And that's where it starts to become hard for me to wrap my head around. And it has nothing against nothing against Peter Rosenti and this knife. Um, Kyle, I totally see why you spend it. And if I had $1,500 to spare and I, it really just meant not a lot to me necessarily, like I, uh, like if the this kind of purchase would feel like this to me if I made more money then yes, I would probably have a few Resentees, to be honest, because I will have another one of the CRKs. I'll probably have a 21 before the year is over, <laughs> to be honest. But yeah, that's where I'm at, guys, as far as uh, value um, and, and uh, that point of diminishing returns. But it really doesn't take anything away from this knife, to be perfectly honest. I think this is every bit of worth what it, what it is. So Oh, I hope you guys enjoyed this. I know this was a very long-winded review. Um, there's a lot to cover with this knife, and this knife is just, it, it deserves it. It really does. Um, sorry if this is too long, and you guys, I probably lost you way back there, but I uh, hope you enjoyed it, and thanks a lot for uh, everything you guys do. Um, I appreciate all of you, and I hope that you have a great day. Thanks a lot.